And I'm going to present to you today on using JDAVIS, which is a Python package for data analysis and visualization in the Python ecosystem. In particular, I'm going to show you how to use Invis, which is a configuration within JDAVIS meant for 2D images. I'm going to show you how to use Invis to change the orientation of your viewer so that you can look at your data in any orientation you like. I'm going to show you how to overlay the footprints of instruments on JWST so that you can perhaps plan an observation. How to make color composites with multi-filter images in JDAVIS. And lastly, I'm going to show you how to visualize data quality arrays uh, on level two data products. And if you don't know what that means, I will explain that when we get there. First thing we're going to do is we are going to import Invis from JDAVIS and several other packages that we're going to use today. I'm going to center this example on a use case that perhaps I study molecular clouds or reflection nebulae. And I really want to work with the Horsehead Nebula. Horsehead Nebula is in Orion and has been imaged by everything. And so I'm going to load an image that's included in your AstroPy distribution, uh, which is called horsehead.fits. This fits file actually comes from the STSCI digitized sky survey. And it's actually a translation of a photographic plate image. So I'm going to load that into Invis like so. I'm going to make an instance of Invis. I'm going to load my data into it. And I'm going to call invis.show, which shows me the viewer with my data in it. In this tutorial, I'm going to switch back and forth between calling commands for JDAVIS in the user interface and by running the Python API in this Jupyter notebook. Both should make uh, consistent calls to the underlying code. And so you could do the same operations either way. And I'm going to try to show you both as I go throughout this tutorial. The notebook is included in the JWebinar materials. And so if you'd like to get exactly what I have on my screen, you can just run all of the code in the cells in this notebook. Now, you may be accustomed to seeing your image of any particular region of the sky in a given orientation, right? And here, this is aligned so that RA is going positive to the left and DEC is going positive going up. So we would call that uh, north, up, east, left. And this orientation uh, is often helpful for many users, but it may not be the orientation that you're accustomed to using. Like, for example, this image of the horsehead nebula doesn't look much like a horse until you turn your head 90 degrees to the right. And so we're going to adjust the orientation of this image in our viewer. The way we can do that is with the orientation plugin. On the right-hand side of my screen, I see a whole bunch of items in this tray. This tray over here can be opened by clicking the three horizontal lines in the top right corner. This is called the plugin tray. And from within here, I can click orientation, which allows me to choose how different images are overlaid on one another. By default, when you load an image into Invis, that image will be aligned with other images such that their 0, 0 coordinate pixel overlaps across all images. That's called align by pixels. The alternative is to align by sky, so that if I load in multiple images with WCS, it will know that the sky coordinates should be aligned across all of the different images. By default, it's going to load this image in at the same orientation that it was in when it was pixel linked. So right now, default orientation is going to be in the same rotation as it was for pixel linked. Now, we could also tweak some of the plot options here to make this plot look the way we want. Uh, right now, we have chosen some stretch for the color map between pixel values and how bright they are on my screen. And I can access those plot options by, for example, closing the orientation plugin and opening the plot options plugin, which gives me many, many knobs to tune. 
So for example, I could change the stretch to be some other function and I can change the stretch limits to be some other function and tweak all of this until it looks the way I want it to look. I have some preset settings that you can adjust to by running this cell here, which will change those to presets that I like for this demo. I'm going to scroll back up and close the plot options plugin. Now I want to rotate this viewer so that it looks more like a horse head. And I'm going to do that by rotating by 90 degrees counterclockwise. I can do that by running this cell over here or in the orientation plugin, I can create a custom orientation with any rotation that I like. Decide if I want east to the left or east to the right. Click add orientation. Now our image is being represented at the orientation that we like. If we want to go back to the other one, we can just toggle between the viewer orientations that we have already loaded. Now, suppose I wanted to plan an observing program. If I wanted to study the reflection nebula over here, some portion of the uh, dark cloud that is absorbing radiation from behind, I might want to study this region right at the edge, the tip of the horse's mane. And if I wanted to do that with, for example, uh, JWST, I would need to know how the field of view of each of the instruments lays in this image. We can do that with the Footprints plugin. I'm going to open the Footprints plugin here. And what pops up is a view of the footprint for one instrument. It's going to give me a selection of instruments from JWST that I can select between. So here's the near cam, uh, sorry, the near spec field of view. I could also choose the nearest field of view or the near cam short wavelength field of view. And if I wanted, I could adjust exactly where I place this field of view on my image until I was satisfied that I'd be able to do the science that I wanted to do in this uh, proposal that I need to prepare. So I could adjust things to get them just so and say, okay, well, if we point the telescope just like this, I can do the science that I want to do at the top of the horse's mane. And I'm going to run this cell just so that we all get exactly the same result, which puts it exactly where I've decided I want it to be for this example. Now, let's say the universe and the uh, Hack are kind, and after I've submitted my JWST uh, cycle N proposal, they agreed that this would be a worthwhile observation to take, and they scheduled observations that used NIRCAM and the short wavelength observing mode to collect the data on this portion of the field of view. Let's say those observations happened successfully, and now I want to load them into Invis. I can load them into the same session. What I'm going to do is I'm going to load three different filters worth of observations. They are at short wavelengths, 0.7 microns up to 2.1 microns. I'm going to use their MAST URIs, which is the way that data products are identified on MAST to load them via Astro Query. And I'm going to run this cell to load them all together. If we look, the observations did land exactly where I planned them. And now that I'm done with this data in the background, I'm just going to remove it from the viewer. You could do that by running this cell or by opening the data drop down menu in the top left and removing that data from the viewer. So those data are no longer visible. What I see now is a version of the viewer where we have the three different filters all viewed together. I'm still showing the footprint that I had planned on, and I can turn that off by changing a setting over here. So right now the footprints plugin has keep active set to true, and that allows us to make the plugin hide the footprint when the footprint Plugin is closed. <laughs> so if the footprint 
plugin is open, I can still see it, but if the footprint plugin is closed, the footprint is no longer visible. All right. And now if I look at these three layers, we're going to hover over them. If I press the B key, we're going to blink between them. So short wavelength, longer wavelength, longest wavelength. Here are the three different layers. If I make them all visible, I'm looking at some kind of color composite, but it's not an especially adept adaptation. <laughs> and so let's make a better color composite. I open up plot options. There's a handy button here called assign RGB presets. If I click that button, the equivalent API command is over here. It's going to go through and change the color of each of the images, also change their opacities, contrast, and biases to give us a rough color composite that might give you a better impression of the color dependence of our information in these observations. I also did a more fine-tuned version of this color composite, uh, which you can get from the API over here. And so this is going to adjust the colors to give us a little bit more contrast out of the same color composite. Now, if we zoom in and we look around, we can see the reddening due to the uh, dust that appears in the mane of the horse head. If we zoom way in, since we're using NearCam, we can see that way deep in there, there are some features. These could be galaxies, these could be something else. Whatever it is, they look pretty reddened. All of that can help you do your science. All right, so this is our demo for RGB composites, changing orientation, and footprints. Now I'm going to demonstrate for you some additional tools that we've added for data quality array inspection. The example data that I was showing you in the previous uh, tutorial is using level three data. Level three refers to which part of the JWST pipeline uh, produced the data product that you're looking at. And the data products that we had just loaded into Invis are the science ready resampled mosaics. They are derived in turn from rate images, which are counts. They are the number of electrons per second detected in each pixel. These calibrated rate images are called level two data products. And before that, there are level one data products, which are the Fowler sampling, right? Like sampling up the ramp in an infrared detector. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about how all of this works, you can always check out JDocs, the JWST documentation online, which describes each of these steps and what their data products contain. What I'm going to show you over here is how we can load one of these level two data products, which are the calibrated rate images, by first downloading it from MAST and then loading it into Invis, just like we did before. The difference this time is that we're going to specify the extensions from this data product that we would like to load. By default, it would load the science data array. What we are adding is that we also want to load the DQ array, which is a different extension in the FITS file. So I'm going to run this cell to load both of those layers. What you can see is that in my viewer, I now have an image. This image, uh, I didn't give you context on, uh, this image is a portion of the Helix Nebula, and I think it's a portion like over here somewhere. We're looking at a, a different beautiful planetary nebula to show you that uh, if I were looking at the raw image without the data quality array, and I will explain how I just turn them on and off again in a moment, it's clear that there's a lot going on in this image. We've got all kinds of emission from something. We also have emission from more compact sources, including things that look like stars and things that look like extended sources. And also there are these small scale features, which could be cosmic rays, that could be other data artifacts from the pipeline. When you're looking at a level three science ready resampled mosaic, a lot of these features have been removed. But when you look at a level two data product, a lot of these features are still present in your data. And it can be hard without inspecting the data quality array to figure out what's going on on a given pixel. 
So for a concrete example, let's zoom in on this region. I'm looking at something that looks like an extended source but is missing a rectangle of flux within it. I don't know what's happening here. But I've loaded in my data quality array. My science data are loaded and it knows about which extension is the science data. It automatically identified the data quality extension. And if I open the data, uh, the data menu, I can turn on and off the data quality array. Turned it back on now, and you can see that many of the pixels in this field of view have been highlighted for one reason or another. If I move my cursor over a pixel that has been flagged, you can see in the top dark blue toolbar up here that next to the value, which is a flux in Megajansky's Perstoradian, there's also a data quality flag, which in this case is four. That contains some information about what the pipeline thinks may or may not be trustworthy about this particular pixel. Now you'd have to be able to decode that data quality value uh, and map it onto some dictionary of meanings for each of these numbers. And the data quality plugin does that for you. And so I'm going to scroll down in the data quality plugin. And you can see that there are many different data quality array values, which can be decomposed into powers of two in parentheses. We were looking at a data quality value of four in this pink part of that feature. If I click on this row, I'm going to see that this corresponds to a jump detected during the exposure. That could mean one of many things. It is diagnostic, though, at telling us what might be going wrong on these pixels. I'm clicking on this eye icon to turn on and off the visibility of the jump detected pixels with a data quality flag of four. There are also pixels here that are labeled five. Five means a jump is detected and you should not use that pixel, that it is truly untrustworthy. Of course, this is all coming from heuristics, and so you should probably think hard about whether or not to use pixels that are flagged at all, but do not use means you really shouldn't use this pixel. There are many flags, and so it's not always useful to look at the full list. So we could also say, perhaps I'm really only concerned if there's saturation dropout. So I'm going to click these two types of bits in the filter by bits dropdown array. And now it's only going to show me the flags that contain those two bits in them. And if I look around, I can see that many fewer pixels are actually affected by this kind of problem. I can zoom in over here and I can see that there are a few pixels in this area that are affected by this flag, which says they are so saturated that you should not use them. So if I toggle on and off the visibility of the data quality array, even though that looks like it should be a real source, if I hover over it, you'll see that the value, the flux value here is NAN because the pipeline is quite confident that something's wrong there. So this is some of how you can use a data quality array in JWST uh, to interpret whether or not your level two data products are trustworthy. We also support Roman and several instruments on HST in the data quality plugin. So I encourage you to load in your data, the lower level data product, the better, and start inspecting to figure out what's good and what's not in the data that you intend to use.